So I interviewed Duke for my blog, go into the story. <laughs> and we had this conversation. I was thinking, I've got to figure out a way to get you guys here for three reasons. One, A Quiet Place is such a phenomenal uh, movie. And many of the students here have read the script and fell in love with it. I just mm -hmm. thought it would be a great, excellent learning opportunity to discuss it. Two, um, you know, in the world of entertainment, as you know, there are some very not nice people, <laughs> but you are very nice folks. And so it's nice to be able to see that there are human beings in the business, <laughs> right? And three, because I think in part you're nice because you're from the Midwest, and I wanted people to know <laughs> that you can be from the Midwest and break into the business like Brian and Scott have done. So let's start there, uh, your life story here in terms yeah. of growing up together in Iowa, and uh, talk about that. Yeah, so um, Brian and I have known each other since we were 11 years old, and we met at a lunch table at Bent North Middle School, like two and a half hours, like just east here of Chicago. And um, we both discovered we were making stop motion movies with our action figures and our Star Wars figures. And we were like, um, our movies could be even bigger and better if we put all of our toys together. And then we'd have like a huge, you know, like Star Wars war or whatever. So yeah, we, it kind of started like that. Yeah, and, then, and um, like in, in high school, we started making a lot of no budget feature length films where we were just wearing all the different hats from writing, directing, producing, being the focus puller, like operating the boom mic and doing like local casting calls in the Quad Cities, um, premiering the movies at the local IMAX theater, doing test screenings at, at like the local community college film class just to see how much our film sucked and learn from, from that experience. And so those were like our film school years really where we had kind of this, this grassroots film education that we were just learning on the job. So. Well, that DIY spirit, yeah. That's really what goes on here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they, they're, 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 because of the gear, the equipment, the support, the fact that we have so many students and they're uh, studying in so many different areas of concentration, they're here the freshman year and they're making movies. And yeah. so what, ab what about that DIY? What are some of the lessons you learned from those micro-budget, those no-budget no films? That, oh, you know? man. I mean, you learn everything. You learn how, w when you're wearing several hats, you learn how important those hats are, right? Like, you learn how important it is to not only record good audio, but um, design audio and post. You learn how important it is to um, use lighting to create a sense of mood or atmosphere. Um, and for us, I think it's made us appreciate those jobs and appreciate when you're able to hire people who are much better at doing that stuff than you are, it's like, you know, it, it, um, it, it elevates your work every time. And it's all, it's all problem solving, like the whole job of filmmaking, whether you're a writer, director, producer, actor, like um, on set, like you're constantly confronted, even when we were like 16 years old, of like a location falling through or like the security kicking you off of like campus so you couldn't shoot at these, these locations. And so all of a sudden, you know, you have six hours till the sun sets and you have to come away from this day with something in the can and you figure out another way to shoot that or you pare down the scene or find a more economical way of telling the story. And I think in terms of how we approach that with our writing careers, when we're on the page, we think about how is this scene going to be produced? Like, is there a smaller version of the scene that still has the same punch and same emotion that might cost, you know, like $100,000 instead of $1 million? So it's all this, this approach of thinking ahead of what you can do to kind of get ahead of all the problems that are, are going to encounter. So you made a lot of these movies when you were in high school, and then yeah. you go to college, University of Iowa, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And um, you continued to do your film education there. How did that work out? Yeah, it was great. I mean, we um, <laughs> it's a lot of skipping class to go make movies, to be honest, <laughs> but it's because we weren't taking a lot of film classes. And, um, and it's something that, um, you know, making movies um, and going through the process is a form of, of film education and, and watching movies and reading scripts, um, and, and that was very important to us. Um, one of, one of the took, cooler things, yeah. though, that we, we took there was like world cinema courses yep. where there were classes that like gave you this huge ed education on German films of like the last, you know, 50 years, and then there was a course on like films from Thailand, and uh, one of the greatest exposures that we had there was um, a French film filmmaker named Jacques Tati, who did these incredible movies in like the 40s, 50s, 60s, and just slightly into the 70s, where he was basically like Mr. Bean, if you know who Mr. Bean is. Like Mr. Bean is just stealing from, from Jacques Tati and doing these incredible visual gags that just taught you everything you needed to know about a scene and what the character's intent was without really saying a word. And that was one of those like 
early inspirations that we had for Quiet Place that just kind of stuck in our head once we were there exposed to that, that type of cinema. Well, it's a beautiful segue because you're at the University of Iowa and that's when you had the inspiration yeah. for A Quiet Place. Mm -hmm. So what was the, I mean, the original conception of that? How did that happen? Well, it was, it was us wanting to, it was us being enamored with these silent films that we were watching, post-silent silent films, like silent films that had sync sound and sound effects, but um, were using a visual language to tell the story. So saying like, oh, we, you know, one day we would love to make our silent film. Like that would be so cool. And we also paired it with this, um, this other class we were taking. It was a nonverbal communications class. And that class opened our eyes to how much people say without actually saying anything. Um, and yeah, and then we're just like, okay, so one day we'll make a silent film. That would be really cool. And then many, many, many years later, we came up with this idea, the story we're working on about a family on a farm that's not talking to each other uh, because they've suffered a tragedy, they've lost a family member and also because maybe there's a monster out in the cornfield that's keeping them quiet. And we're like, oh, Eureka, that's our silent film. Like, now it's not a gimmick anymore. Now it, now it has a story and we can have characters and we can kind of combine them. But um, we're always trying to uh, pay attention to what's going on in our life, Various, whether it's classes or you know, just personal life experiences, just trying to like, pilfer as much and, and always writing down ideas and sometimes Sometimes like A Quiet Place, it, it turns out to be a screenplay that we eventually get to. And most of the time, it's just a bunch of, um, you know, reckless kind of <laughs> note taking uh, that never turns into anything. But I mean, you had that conceit, right? You make a sound, you die. Wasn't yeah. that kind of yeah. the initial yeah, of spark? Yeah. Yeah, it was. And, and again, as Brian was saying, like we had that for so long and we were like, how do we appropriate this into a movie that can sustain itself for more than just a short film? And I think it did come down to that eureka moment of it has to be about people you care about and that you're rooting for. And it's not just a gimmick that you see on a movie poster and brings you into the theater, but it's what keeps you in that seat at the end of the day. Well, the log line, for those of you who haven't seen it, and you should see it, <laughs> A family must navigate their lives in silence after mysterious creatures that hunt by sound threaten their survival. And that's from Paramount. And they actually have the tagline, if they hear you, they hunt you. So it's almost mm -hmm. like exactly the right. same conceit that yeah. you had. Yeah. I mean, they used it in marketing. So you get this idea, but then apparently life kind of got in the way. It took you some time mm -hmm. to kind of come back to it. Could you talk about how you ended up uh, breaking into Hollywood? Yeah, so our, our first step into Hollywood was when we were in college, we entered one of our films into this competition sponsored by uh, MTV. TV, right? Yeah, right. MTV. Mm -hmm. And w from that, we won a uh, development deal with MTV Films. But what we didn't know as college kids was this development deal wasn't like a real development deal. It was like MTV just putting on a competition. And, and for like years, we were literally years we were negotiating this contract because like <laughs> MTV Business Affairs did not really care about the two kids from Iowa that wanted to make a movie. And um, we ended up like pushing on them, navigating ourselves to this, this incredible guy, David Gale, who used to head up MTV Films. And he became a mentor for us, where he really has wanted to foster like young filmmakers' careers. And he greenlit a pilot for us, gave us a small amount of money to go back to Iowa and film this, this pilot called Spread. And we use that as a directing calling card. And at the same time, we were writing uh, a script for this film called Nightlight and kind of finished that right when we finished the directing sample and kind of put those two things together and we're like, we want to make this as a feature film, here's our directing sample and voila. But um, that's like over the course of like six years though. So mm. it was, With it an took immense forever. amount of failure. And rejection. And rejection. And like writing in scripts that um, we tried to get like representation through agencies and like everybody passed, throwing them into competitions, yeah, everybody our, like rejecting them. Very quickly we realized that um, the MTV thing wasn't super real. Like it was real to us, but it wasn't quite real to them. But we were able to like use it as leverage to get meetings at agencies and, and attempt to, you know, like, oh, we have a development deal with MTV. Would you guys, you know, be interested in, in meeting with us? And so but it was, was a flat out no. Like, they still passed true. on us at yeah, the time. This so is true. It was, um, but it, it gave us, like, those years to realize, like, it's really difficult. And one of the most important lessons is to persevere and to know that failure is just part of the process. And you shouldn't take rejection as you're no good. Like, you should give up. It's really about can you take your failures and kind of still fail upwards and find a way to navigate around them? Uh, yeah, your, your story uh, 
Because I, I would imagine that you, you pitch this idea to someone, yeah, we want to make this movie where there's like hardly any dialogue. Mm -hmm. People would say, oh, okay, nice to see you. 100%. <laughs> yeah. nobody, nobody, was in, nobody was excited about the idea. And we did pitch it to a lot of um, executives and producers that w really did, like, they were familiar with our work and we had been trying to find something to work together on. And we'd be like, oh, we have this cool idea about this family on a farm. And nobody thought it was a cool idea for whatever reason and, and probably because we're just terrible at pitching and, and weren't very good at selling the idea um, um, verbally but um, but it was just something that we really dug so we kept coming back to it and we, we also wrote it with the safety net meaning that we knew if like everybody in Hollywood passed on the script it was an idea that we could execute back in Iowa for like a much cheaper number than what Hollywood throw. Like we could shoot it, shoot a fifty thousand dollar version of it. Like you don't need movie stars for it to work. And so we um, we had that tenacity that we don't care if we get rejected. We're just going to go off and make this movie no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I think that having that passion and that game plan helped us get to the goal line a little faster with a little more you know conduit. So I want to talk about some of the key story choices you made, and I want to frame it with a quote from an mm -hmm. author, uh, Janet Finch. She says, quote, the writer is both a sadist and a masochist. We create people we love and then we torture them. <laughs> the more we love them and the more cleverly we torture them along the lines of their greatest vulnerability and fear, mm -hmm. the better the story. Yeah. Sometimes we try to protect them from getting boo-boos that are too big, don't. This is your protagonist, not your kid. Yes. Put your protagonist in a situation where they fear yeah. something. I that, right? yeah. love that quote so much, and it reminded, the opposite of that reminded, reminds me of um, all of our early work, which is treating, the, you, you love your characters so much sometimes that you want to be very nice to them, and you want them to be happy, and you want them to be able to overcome obstacles, and it's just not fun to watch it's not there's no conflict it's less it's less exciting and I think putting the lesson we've learned over time is you want to put your characters through hell and make and make make the objective that they're trying to achieve as hard as possible and the pregnancy thing you had like early on in the process. Yeah, it was one of those things that existed in that 15 page proof of concept and it just came from like a conversation that Brian and I kept having about when we were building out the idea of this and the story. What's the worst thing that can happen? What's the worst thing that can happen? And of course we felt like trying to have a baby in this, this type of world is gonna be the worst thing to happen and then we're like, oh, let's put a nail into this story oh. too. <laughs> so, so it was um, it was always trying to one up ourselves in terms of the tension and where can we really take the characters so that you're tightening the screw constantly. The nail is such a great setup. It's like you have all these little ticking bombs. You mm -hmm. know, you know yeah. she's yeah. going to have to go into labor yeah. at some mm -hmm. point, and so you're mm -hmm. building toward that. But yeah. the nail is such a great setup. It's a simple thing, but you yeah. know, at some point, that's going to come back to really bite. Somebody. Well, and a and a tiny window into our process is. We like to surprise, like we like to um, live in the script and surprise ourselves sometimes. So with the nail, we wrote that into the script very early on in the first 20 pages, but we had no idea where that was going to pay off. And we just let the story kind of ratchet up to its most intense moment, and then we're like, now is a good time for her to step on the nail. Like that would be kind of horrible. So another thing you did that was interesting uh, was. You could have explained a lot of it. You could have done a crawl up front and explained the right. post-apocalypse. You dropped us in, they call it the Latin phrase, right? In media race. You mm -hmm. sort of dropped us in there. And that was a conscious decision? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think we're, we love post-apocalyptic films. So like we've all seen what the landscape is and what that looks like. And for us, we felt the audience should be exactly in line with the characters. Like you're kind of thrown into this, like an episode of Twilight Zone, where it's kind of a mystery, but you're walking through what the normal life is of these characters and you start seeing weird things that they're doing and it kind of unfolds um, just like the best mysteries ever. And we just love that type of storytelling. And so that's kind of where we, we aspired to be with that. I, I saw a Reddit thread uh, and one of the common commenters said uh, about your script. Course, you know, Reddit was it nice or yeah. was it? <laughs> was it <laughs> I hope it's not. Those are always more said, interesting. I guess my point is why can't you be different? Yeah. Why can't you try doing your own thing? If a 68-page 68 68 spec horror by two relative unknowns, I guess mm -hmm. that would be, you know, <laughs> filled with photoshopped images of buildings, buttons, and monopoly boards can get bought by Paramount, then surely anything is possible. <laughs> uh, and I think that's true, but I like what you yeah. were saying here. It's got to serve the story, yeah. right? It's yeah. not like I have people come up, I want to write a, uh, you know, a non just non-linear story. I like mm -hmm. Tarantino. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Why? Well, because like, it's cool. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, sure. does it serve the story? Sure. So that's, yeah. a, that's a fair point, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. So talk to us about how the script ended up at Paramount. 
Yeah, so we, um, so, so after everybody kind of um, questioned our sanity about why we would want to do a silent film and, and, and kind of made us very, very deeply uh, insecure about, about the project, we wrote it anyways because we're crazy. And, um, and we <laughs> did another stupid thing. We, um, we took it to Michael Bay's company, the loudest filmmaker in the history of cinema. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the team over there, Michael and, um, and Brad and Drew and Aaron Janis, um, really responded to the script. And they, they totally got it. We sat down with them with very skeptical. We were like, all right, what do you guys got? Like, what do you, what do you guys, you know, what's your plan for the movie? Like, what would you do? And they, the most important thing to us is that two things. One, they understood that we wanted to make an emotional movie with characters, a movie, a, a movie that's scary but could, in its best, in its best form, also move an audience. And they wanted to make them get the movie made fast. And um, I, I think any screenwriter's worst nightmare is a is a movie that languishes in development hell where you rewrite it over and over and over again and then it never gets made. Yeah, and what, what kind of tipped the scales for us to go with them is um, they were like, we're gonna take this immediately into Paramount, like not develop it, um, and just try and get the green light. And Paramount bought the script, basically, once they had read it. And then shortly after that, um, it fell into the hands of John and Emily. So what, what happened was um, our producers at Michael Bay's company were working with John on the Jack Ryan TV show that just came out. and. John, they passed it to John, John read it, really, really loved it. He passed it to Emily Blunt, and we th were like, that's, that's weird, like how, how does he know Emily Blunt? Not know <laughs> like, We're just like, famous married. people just like <laughs> hang out all the time together? Like what is this so weird? And so um, John and Emily read it like over a weekend um, and called up like through the agency and they're like, we wanna do this, John wants to direct it. Like, Here's a package, and we were pitched that. And, and you have you also have film, and basically. you also have to understand how surreal that was because when we sat down with Platinum Dunes, they were like, "Who do you guys imagine to be in this movie?" And we did not have the confidence to say Emily Blunt should be in this movie. Instead, what we said was someone you know, like someone like Emily Blunt. You know, like obviously not Emily Blunt, like but like somebody <laughs> who's you know great like her and. You know, so it was it was absolutely surreal phone call. Yeah, and based on that, Paramount gave it like the release date, so it's like a no brainer to like embrace that package and just like move forward with the with the production. So. It's so funny you say Michael Bay. Uh, I, I saw one of his movies, Transformers movies, Revenge of the Fallen, with my yeah. nine year old son at the time. I said, "What was that movie about?" And he said, "Blowing stuff up." <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then well they have your movie, which is you know about quiet. I mean, right. that's kind of ironic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the movie gets produced, and as I said, it's done $332 million. Uh, at the time it was released, I retweeted a variety of articles talking about how the movie was far exceeding its projections, mm -hmm. you know? And I tweeted something like, huh, a movie that's not a prequel, a sequel, a remake, or a reboot. It's almost like people want to see original films. Right, I know. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That's how we've been feeling for years. You know, and, and nobody, <laughs> nobody in Hollywood was asking for the script, and nobody wanted us to work on it because it wasn't IP. And even now, we still have conversations with our lovely agents every day about, like, you guys should do this book, or this comic book thing, or this, this, and that. And we're like, as moviegoers, we want to see stuff that's different. I want to see Star Wars before it was Star Wars because mm. the discovery of something new can be so special and it's something that the movie, um, the movie industry used to do so well. Yeah, and I know I think about like when we were um, like in middle school and high school and our favorite films are like that, that year that everyone talks about, like 1999, where you have American Beauty, you have uh, Magnolia, you have Fight Club. The Fight Sense. Club's based on a book, I suppose, but still, like it was original really filmmaking and writing and it was something that was bringing a new edge to to the cinemas, and we're constantly like yearning for for movies in the multiplex like that. You know, as much as you know, we love the spectacle of comic book movies and the Star Wars movies. We also adore a movie like Eighth Grade, where it's just an original voice, unique characters, you know, and then just wanting to follow those type of stories. Um, so you're from the Midwest. Do you have any uh, aspirations, maybe, to bring some of the filmmaking back here, or oh, try and yeah. develop the community? Absolutely. That's here? our that's our dream. Yeah, I mean, shooting in Iowa, shooting in Chicago, we've got a lot of friends here. Um, we love films that have a unique uh, space to them. So um, one of our favorite filmmakers is like Alexander Payne, and watching movies like Election or About Schmidt. 
they're about such unique life experiences and people and you know whatever we can do to to you know give our own like experience from Iowa we would love to do that and bring them back and and I think you said you saw somebody today who was a friend of yours who yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. like one of our, our great friends who we grew up making movies with he was a he produced like all our student films he lives and works here in Chicago like producing um, producing independent movies and he's had a run of just great success like doing movie after movie and it's so satisfying to see people being able to make careers not just in LA or New York but here in the Midwest okay, okay. we have some questions yeah. Say, please say your name and uh, speak up loudly, please. Hello. Yep. Um, my name is John Stremak. I'm an animation student. And I'm curious, like, uh, about your concept of the, the boogeyman, per se. Like, what exactly are you planning to do with the story? Is it more of, like, it how it explores, like, a monster exploring people's fears? Or is it going to be, like, a society's population to an urban myth, see, like, what people do about it? Do people do about it? Do people just ignore it? Like, what kind of spin are you trying to ex explore such a, a, a figure that's ingrained in our society but is not taking it seriously? How do you plan to approach that? I love the question. I'm trying to decide right now how much we're allowed to even talk <laughs> about. They'll kill us if we say too much. But it's but a fantastic question, and, and those are all things we're thinking about. Um, I think to like a certain degree, um, I don't know if this will specifically answer the question, but um, what, what we love in, in storytelling and filmmaking in general is like, it's about what you don't see. So we want to have something that is terrifying because there's little marks of it around the, around the house and that it's, um, I'm trying to stop myself from going too far here. But like scratches um, on the floor or something? It, it's <laughs> the idea that it's infecting a family. And I guess that's probably as much as I can really say. But we, we want to keep it somewhat contained. But it but read the short feel, story. Feel the short yeah. story is terrific. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we're definitely definitely using a lot from the short story. Great. Awesome. Thank great, you. Great, great Thank question. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Who's next? Uh, I have a very stupid question, but I would regret if I didn't ask you this. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the rules in this world that you created was if there's going to be a sound, there needs to be a larger sound happening elsewhere. Yeah nearby, so you guys set this up with the pregnancy by having fireworks prepared for, you know, months in advance. Yeah. Um, right. My question was, was there a huge conversation that you guys had to have where someone was like, okay, but what if somebody farts? And like, <laughs> I just, I, I saw this, question. and I was like, <laughs> I saw this movie and I was like, I just want to yeah. have been in the room and someone was like, okay, but like farting happens and how are you going to do that? Well, that was it? the room every day. Yeah. It was like, uh, and it's taken like so much restraint not to re-edit the movie with and, a bunch of fart noises. And, I, <laughs> yeah. and when SNL did a parody of A Quiet Place, it was really cool. They did this thing called The Kanye Place with, with Kanye West. It was very funny, but we were like, really? Like, they didn't go for the fart jokes? I guess like, it was like too low brow, Yeah, but I don't know, that's our style. Um, no, that's like, yes, the farting thing was something we joked <laughs> about, but like that was a conversation about what sounds like attract things and why can't you just have sounds constantly on and that just I'm sorry, there's no serious way to answer this question, man. <laughs> well, do you have any other questions? <laughs> I guess the only way to make that more serious is um, in writing a script like this, there's going to be obvious little like yeah. loopholes or things yeah. that you have to kind of navigate yeah. around, yeah. like real world problems that you're yes. like, okay, but we don't need to have one of our characters silently fart into a pillow to let the, like, <laughs> to right. let the audience yeah. know that we're thinking about it. Yeah. Like that doesn't, so I guess how did you yes. avoid farting? No, or like how did you avoid <laughs> having to do that? You just wrote the opening scene for the sequel there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then we'll have the one guy that didn't fart in the pillow. And I think. Um, I think to answer, to attempt to answer this question seriously, um, what was interesting is what you didn't have to explain. Mm. What we found, and maybe we didn't pull it off. So you can tell us if we really did need that scene with the pillow. Um, <laughs> but it, it did feel like at a certain point, um, you could you could kind of the audience would just kind of go with you. You know, it's like the the big concept is. Um, if you make a sound, you die, and this family has learned how to live life as quietly as possible, mm -hmm. and that's the buy-in, and you either buy that or you don't buy that. And I think, too, if you, um, if you write characters that seem like they're making rational decisions and they're using some intelligence behind it, like, 
They learned how to fire. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Yes. Learned, <laughs> yeah. You just you just get in bed, you pull the covers over, right. and you okay. Dutch oven. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you for letting me indulge in that. So I appreciate it. We just got a. That was the best question. Yeah. 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 Is that the best question, yeah. you guys? Again. I think we're done for the night. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, That's a tough. Uh, that's a tough follow-up. Okay. Next That's question, follow please. Up. Well, um, name? My name's Kaylee. My Kaylee. name's Kaylee. I'm not a student. I run a local nonprofit for independent filmmakers. Um, uh, I feel like a kind of two-parter. Do you guys have kids? I do. I, yeah. yeah. You do. Did you have kids while you were writing? No, but I was like, my wife and I were having like that conversation, and it led to um, thinking like a potential father and being terrified about how do you protect your kids and what's it like having a baby and try to be quiet around the house and not wake them up. And now I'm living that nightmare. But it's the best <laughs> nightmare in the world. But it's, um, yeah, it definitely like informs the storytelling, like it, going through at least that theoretically and now going through it in actuality. And I would so. add to that, John did have, I think they had mm -hmm. two kids had two at the kids. time. He had just and had a second kid like two weeks before he read the script. Yeah, something. and so a lot of what he brought to the table was that kind of, personal experience. Yeah, yeah that, so that was like the second part of my question. Do you think that like Emily and John's relationship and like parenthood in themselves like really enhanced what you wrote? Absolutely. Or was Absolutely. It yeah, I know um, like in pre-production, like every, the whole family, like John, Emily, and uh, Millie and Noah, they were up in New York and they just had like a backyard barbecue where they were just getting to know each other and um, Millie and Noah had their parents there and and John and Emily got to know and see what that parenting style was like and how their parents connected to, to their kids, to Millie and Noah. And it was one of those things where that small cast was able to become such a family unit so quickly that I think it, it brought together the, the feeling of the film so much, so much more than what the situation could have been otherwise. So. Amazing, thank you. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Millie was fantastic. And she was so good. She She's was so good. Amazing. Such a nice person. Yeah, great person. Okay, next question. Hi, uh, my name is Ronan Morrissey. I'm a also a film directing major as well. Awesome. So the main question I have is, when you're in film school, a lot of professors put the emphasis the emphasis on uh, filmmaking that cinema is like pure visual storytelling, mm -hmm. and it seems that today's market, a lot of movies kind of um, left that, and now it's really dialogue driven movies. So how are you able to market a movie that has very little dialogue? It's all visual. Mm -hmm and kind of avoid the stigma of like silent movies? Hmm. Good Great, question. Yeah. You know, it never felt like a stigma to us um, doing a silent movie. To us, that felt cool. But as you say that, I, I remember, you know, like our press talking points from the studio were like, don't mention it's a silent movie. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I'd... Yeah, I think in the writing phase, again, it kind of came down to the, um, the, in, the style of the screenplay. Like there was a certain degree where we knew this was going to be very audio intensive, so how do you communicate that through a script? And it came down to figuring out we need to play with kind of the, the size of the fonts to be able to emphasize where sounds are really loud. But at the same time, you can't just have like loud sound after loud sound after loud sound. So you go back to your storytelling toolkit and figure out what are the peaks and valleys of, of this movie. And then beyond that, like just writing sequences that hopefully feel very visual and that every time, like, in the pregnancy sequence, like knowing that there's gonna be fireworks like in the sky and just being able to read that on a page, hopefully will will conjure somewhat of a visual idea of how this cacophony of noise and suspense is all coming together. So it's it all comes back to figuring out the best way to tell your story. And if you're working in a genre like this, how do you keep the intensity level up? And I think the visuals will hopefully flood in after the fact. So um, one thing I think in response to that. Uh, I agree with you, Brian. I mean, that's a strong story concept. It's something that would mm -hmm. be distinctive. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk a little bit about that because I, we always harp on this here, in, at least in my classes, that you have to be working with the strongest story concept possible. Uh, obviously, you need to resonate with the material. But how important do you think it is, say, particularly if you're writing on spec, the story concept? It's, 100%. It's, it's everything. It's, you have to give... Um, our feeling is you have to give audiences a reason to come to the theater. You have to give them um, something, hopefully an idea that's exciting, that, that says like, oh wow, that'll be a roller coaster ride, or that'll take me to a place I've never been before. Um, and, and as a spec, especially because so many movies being made right now are based on um, books, comic books, movies that have already been made. Um, to, to break through as a spec, as to write something on your own, um, it needs to be a noisy idea. 
um, something that'll create a lot of whatever disruption and, and get people excited and, and kind of cut through all the noise of all the content that we're kind of inundated with on a regular basis. Yeah, I think in some respects, you know, this idea of high concept seemed to fade a little bit back uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but it seems like nowadays you need to be thinking more like that because yeah. the, have you heard this phrase out there, untested stories, right? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what they're calling yeah. original mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. untested mm -hmm. stories. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. You have to really come at it with a strong thing that they know they can market, you know? Because yeah. mm -hmm. your movie was, oh, that's the, that's the quiet movie. That's the movie without, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, and there, I mean, there, as crass as it may be, like there was a certain amount of um, brainstorming about that, like even in the writing process, knowing what the teaser might look like. And then when Paramount ended up cutting the teaser, like seeing all the benchmarks of the story that are setting up kind of the landscape of what it is, but cutting it off before you're giving everything away from the story. And so engineering sequences to know, oh, this might be the marquee sequence that you can put in a trailer, but also letting there be something else kind of lurking in the background. And what that was to us was always kind of the family dynamic that, yeah. that brings you through. So I guess uh, one last question here for you. Uh, you know, I'm sure you get asked it a lot, but for, particularly for students here in the DePaul program and the mm -hmm. undergraduate and MFA program, uh, what's the best advice you can give to filmmakers, to writers, in terms of how they should go about living their daily lives trying to break into the business, yeah. trying to become... Yeah. Um, so well, here's some practical advice. Because aside from like obviously like becoming the best at your craft that you can possibly be, and, and studying and, and working and, and creating um, creating work, I, that all goes without saying. But some practical advice um, to be a professional is 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 starting like for example, if you're a writer or a director moving out to L.A., New York, or staying in Chicago because there's a lot of awesome work happening here. Um, it's great to get in with the people who are in your class. And that is one of the terrific things that we did not get um, by not going to film school. You, you have a class, you have um, peers who are working and making um, projects with you and you guys are all going to rise through the ranks together. So one of the mistakes we made early on in our career is we we're like, oh, we're, um, you know, we love M. Night Shyamalan and we want to you know, write movies like that. So we need his agent to rep us and then we'll be on Night Shyamalan, you know, like that kind of like naive thinking that goes on when you're young. And it's, it's not, that's not the right approach. The right approach is who is the assistant to the assistant of M. Night Shyamalan's agent, right? Like who is where you're at when you're younger um, and trying to break in? Who, who's at the same point in their career that needs you just as much as you need them? And you can find that through Whatever means, you know, like networking and and um, and and whatever. But you know, find your class and help them, and they will help you, and you guys will all rise together. That would be the yeah. best piece. Yeah, and of then the just really know that your career is really in your hands. So, again, for the longest time, we were trying to figure out like how do we get to that manager or agent to help unlock the doors. And what we learned is that even when you have them, you still have to hustle and create your own opportunities. And it goes back to what we were doing in high school earlier making our own films and not asking for permission at all and just going off and doing it and having that hands-on experience and so again if you're if you're a writer like find a filmmaker that you really like that you could collaborate with and get your project made or if you're a writer and you can direct like just go off and make that movie or if you're an actor producer like find the collective that that you can you know work with and create this brain trust and just get things made and then as soon as that's made start moving on to the next thing. Like, I think the, the one thing that we always try to do is keep four to five projects happening at once, and they're in different stages. Two are usually in the, in the forefront, and three are like in development, but juggling a lot of things um, is tough, but it also gives you more lottery tickets to have. Yeah, we, we talk about lottery tickets all the time. Um, again, no matter what position you are in film, writer, director, producer, actor, cinematographer, production designer, you're just trying to buy as many lottery tickets as possible because to a certain extent, the business is a bit of a crapshoot. Um, but the more lottery tickets you have, in other words, the more opportunities you create for yourself, the more projects you're working on, the more people you're meeting, uh, the higher your odds are of, of winning the lottery. Well, uh, thanks so much, Scott and Brian, and uh, let's give a round of applause for... Thank you, guys. Come on. That was great. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.